and for the SNCs listening in that um, don't have that <clears throat> weapon yet, where they can add value uh, from a skills point of view to a program, so the program, yeah, they're not getting headhunted or they're not um, getting invited into the program, so they need to try and develop that. What would be your advice uh, for for developing a, a strength when you're early on in your career to get those opportunities? Yeah, just to just to get a real diverse range of experiences and and not necessarily paid ones, you know, and some of them are pretty hard to come by and. And even at the Roosters, you know, we, we've sort of got a uh, an intern program. And I, I think it's an accepted thing these days that, you know, people coming straight out of uni will do an internship where, you know, they won't be earning any money, but hopefully they're going to be learning some great skills. But, you know, my advice would be to get a try and get a diverse range of skills and probably more specifically, you know, improve, improve your mo- movement IQ. You know, if you're if you're not from a track and field background or you don't have a, a you know a movement based background i think that's an area that you should really try and upskill yourself in how would you sort of marry up the, between the art of of coaching and, and sports science obviously it's developed a fair bit um, more recently but um, yeah how do you balance the two uh, in your current role as uh, head of performance yeah look that's a really good question i think it's probably one of the biggest challenges for practitioners at the moment but i think that at the end of the day, like we've got to remember we're working with people, you know, and, and every person's different. Um, and you've got to understand that, you know, each athlete, you know, what, what you ask them to do and, you know, a program that you provide for them, um, mm-hmm. they will respond differently to that. Uh, so from an art point of view, you've, you've got to understand your people. You've got to be intuitive enough to know, you know, how your, your staff are going, how, how your players are going in particular. Um, and be able to adjust based on what you're seeing there. And what about for the, the technical, tactical coaches? How do you sort of use GPS with them, uh, whether it be in meetings or while you're planning training sessions? Yeah, look, the same way, in, in a way. You know, then the good coaches will always say, well, why are we doing this? You know, what, mm. why are you prescribing this session? And I, I always find that, you know, really good, you know, because you've got to justify um, yeah, why you're prescribing a certain, you know, training plan and training program. So, um, but, you know, a lot of coaches and our current coach, you know, is, is really sports science intelligent. So, you know, you can go through a GPS report with him and he'll absolutely understand it. But, you know, some you've got to just, yeah, talk them through it and walk them through it and say, well, this is what this is showing and this is why we're doing a certain, uh, a certain drill or a certain, you know, training session and, and make sure that yeah you're able to justify it, and it's it's absolutely relative to the game model that they're they're trying to roll out. And going back to planning and processes, you've mentioned a few <laughs> that you've um, that you, you routinely do during the week, whether it be while you're training, you're getting creative with your um, training prescription, and and Sunday afternoons is sort of your thinking time in terms of what is you know what visualizing the week. What are some other sort of high performance sort of planning processes that you've uh, you're in routine? Um, in doing in, in season or, or might be in pre-season that you find is quite effective? Yeah, look, I suppose my, my big thing, I, I like to start with the macro cycle and work down. You know, I, I really like the, the the long-term plan and being able to, you know, for example, we spent last week looking at our pre-Christmas and our post-Christmas before round one already for 2023. And for me, I, I love that. You know, I love working on that sort of macro pardon me, macro cycle, because that then gives me structure and it gives me a framework that I can then, you know, put our other loading cycles through. You mentioned the importance of having a healthy environment where people can challenge each other. Does that change depending on who's in the room or do you think that should that's the way it should be? As long as it's done respectively, of course, you should always, no matter what, who's in the room, you should be able to challenge each other respectfully as in staff members. Yeah, I, th- I, I think so. And look, you know... <clears throat> The two years I was out of sport, I, you know, I studied, but also worked in corporate in leadership and culture. And, you know, psychological safety is is the big thing with corporate teams at the moment. And it's no different to sporting teams um, and staff within sporting teams. You need to be, be able to feel comfortable and confident that if you say something, it's not going to be held against you. Um, and if you say something about someone that's constructive, that hopefully they're not going to take that personally, but there needs to be a, a safe environment and, and you as the, as the speaker and the other person potentially as the, the listener and the receiver needs to feel 
that it's coming from the right place.